Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. I'll tell you, when I thought about this, and you can believe I've thought about this a lot, uh, technical difficulties never crossed my mind. <laughs> so, but I am Sharon. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and by the grace of God and the fellowship of this program, I haven't had the need to have a drink since January 8th, 1992. So, now, you can subtract as well as I can, and you know that that's only two years and two months. And so when Diane called me and asked me if I was if I was willing to give my story, I said, you know, I don't have a lot of sobriety. There's lots of people who get up there with 20 years, 15 years, and, you know, what possibly can I um, offer at this as a newcomer, basically as a newcomer to the program? And Diane is a very persistent woman <laughs> and said, oh, no, you know, everybody has a message to deliver. And what I'm hoping to do tonight, um, what I'm hoping to do is to tell you a story about a woman who was um, – had really lost herself, and, and that was the woman I was. Um, and I think that uh, the journey that I'm going to describe is about the separation of who I presented to the world and who I really was. And um, what I'm hoping to do, which I never did when I was drinking, is to speak to you about the truth and from my heart to your heart. So uh, I do thank the committee very much for um, suggesting that I uh, have this experience. <laughs> Uh, my sponsor said when I said to her, now this is December that Diane calls, and uh, and I said to my sponsor, now, you know, do you think it's a good idea? Oh, yeah, she said, but it does ruin a week. And I said, oh, a week? This has the potential to ruin a quarter. And, but actually, it didn't. It really did pretty much ruin about a week. But uh, uh, she's right, as always. Uh, now, what I'd also like to say is that um, I have... Um, I can, if for our non-AA friends, for our Al-Anon friends, there's plenty in my story that um, will serve you too. I can walk both sides of those streets and do and do it proudly. So um, I, and I also then want to say that my daughter is here, and Amy, what I want to say to you is a public amend, that some of what I may talk about is painful. It's painful for me. And so I offer an amend to you before I even begin for whatever pain it causes you. So, what it was like, and what happened, and what is it like now? And um, I think the most important thing for me to begin with is to talk about um, that it is a spiritual journey. This has been uh, an incredible spiritual awakening for me, that the steps have um, proved to be exactly what they've promised to be, and that is that having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, and I say that as I go to sleep every night, that is exactly what has happened to me. So what I want to describe is how did that spiritual awakening happen and what was happening to me before. So as people do, I'm going to go back to the very beginning, um, my childhood. And like many, or unlike many, um, although I am grateful often to hear that others have had this experience, I really had quite a happy childhood. I was a very loved, um, very loved daughter, and I was particularly loved because I was a daughter. Um, I know my mother tells the story of I have an older brother, and um, they very much wanted a girl. And so when I was born, in those days, many years ago, those <laughs> they knocked the mothers almost completely out. And so as she was sort of groggily coming to, they said, you know, it's a girl. And she said to the doctor, are you sure? <laughs> he said, yes, we see a lot of these, and this one's a girl. <laughs> so, so, so they were happy. And, uh, you know, and so I, I was raised with knowing that I was loved and feeling that at almost every turn. What I learned early on, though, is that there were roles in our family, as there are roles in every family, and the role that my brother had, four years older than I, was that he was the smart one. Now, he happens to be very smart. He's turned out to be a very, you know, gifted writer, and he's off, you know, at Yale, and he does fabulous things, and he's smart. And he always was smart, and he was years ahead of himself in school, and so he was the smart one. So I came along, and smart had been taken, so that was out. <laughs> so... So I got to be the happy one. <laughs> and, you know, as 
It didn't matter if I brought home straight A's. It really didn't matter. I couldn't fill the smart role, so I had to be the happy one. It happened to be that I was a happy kid with good grades, but I was the happy one. What I learned early, early on was that I was not only responsible for my own happiness and that that was the feeling I was allowed. I wasn't allowed anger. I wasn't allowed sadness. I wasn't allowed fear. I wasn't allowed anything else. I was allowed only uh, happiness. And if I wasn't happy, you better get yourself there in a hurry and not share it with anybody at any rate. You know, whatever I did in the way of um, feelings before I learned to bury them so deeply, well, I, I really don't have any memory of because I know I was expected to be happy. And um, in addition to my own happiness, I was very acutely aware that I was responsible for the happiness of all the people in my family. That if there was a problem in this family, then it was my job to be funny, it was my job to be cute, it was my job to be um, entertaining, to divert the attention. In some way, that was became my job. And I remember um, knowing that when I was a very little girl, like first, second grade, I remember knowing that. I remember laying, however, out in the, on the, we lived in California. You probably knew I was a California girl. <laughs> and, and in fact, I, I didn't leave California until I was 23, so I really was born, reared, and, and had all those California attributes. Although we lived in the Central Valley of California, which is no real picnic, it's a good place to be from. And, um, but I remember laying out on the, the weather was nice most of the time, and um, the, I laying out on the grass looking up at the clouds thinking that I was the luckiest person in the whole world. That in fact, you know, it was before salt, this is really going to date me, before the salt vaccine, and so I remember thinking, I'm probably going to get polio because I am so happy. I have this wonderful family, and I'm the luckiest kid in the world, and so something's going to befall me, some kind of tragedy, because I don't deserve, why me, to deserve all of this um, pleasure. Well, um, what I learned then, um, all of these things kind of mesh together for me, but what I learned is that I was... Um, conditionally loved to a certain degree. To a certain degree, I was unconditionally loved. You know, they were thrilled that I was there. But I also know that um, in our family, there was a lot of emphasis on being correct, following rules, um, doing things the way they are supposed to be done. Uh, not and all oh, a lot of concern about what the neighbors would say. You know, what would they think? Well, it never crossed my mind not to worry what they thought. But I, because I worried a lot, my mother worried a lot about what they thought. And so. Um, I learned, you know, that that as long as you follow the rules, as long as you stay happy, as long as you present well to the rest of the world, then uh, everything is just fine. What I didn't learn and didn't really know for a long time was that um, lots of what we covered up in our family was about alcoholism, and it was about the alcoholism of my father. The part that was so unknown to me was that he was really not abusive. He was a happy sort of drunk and wasn't, and he was very rule oriented as well. I learned early how to drink by rules because he would drink Wednesday nights and Saturday nights. <laughs> and not really any other nights that in the beginning, at least in my childhood, but those nights, boy, Wednesday and Saturday were, you know, they, he was going to drink and, and that was, you know, just the way that went. But, um, so that's really what we were covering up to a certain degree. We were covering up the fact that, that he was alcoholic. There were all kinds of other issues around poverty, and uh, although we weren't poor, but we weren't rich, and it was, you know, early struggling days, post-war days, and, and it was tough. They were, they were not easy times for my parents. Um, and in terms of religion, I really wanted to kind of focus on the spiritual development because I think – that when I think for myself about the lack of self or the loss of self that began for me really very early for me um, in that separation between who do you present to the world and who are you, that in that very beginning, any um, soul that I might have, any, any realness that I might have was really separated from me early. And as I think about spirituality now, um, to me, it's about that congruence between uh, who I am and, and uh, who I present and how I relate to you. And it's all about uh, myself. So if I'm, if I'm presenting a separate self, then my soul, my spirituality is really a missing piece. So while we did a lot around religion, I'm not certain that there was much at all, if anything, around spirituality. I don't remember even um, thinking much about any of that kind of, uh, you know, ethereal sort of spiritual stuff. Um, I do have some very painful memories of church. And um, 
uh, we went regularly went to church every Sunday morning, like because what would the neighbors think if you didn't? And uh, you know, and my brother, my, my my brother, was the one who found this church, and so we went to this church and went every Sunday and. And it was very male-dominated, and and the God that we were taught to um, fear was a very male personified, and lots of fear around, you know, being struck down. And in fact, I think it relates very well to my thinking that I get polio because I must have believed in a God that would punish, if, um, you know, or that I didn't deserve it, and therefore God would do something punishing. I remember um, many, many Sunday mornings not being able to um, go to church, feeling nausea. nausea. Uh, now, later in life, I felt nausea on Sunday morning for other reasons, but in those days, I just didn't want to go to church. And so for a long time, in fact, still to a certain degree, I can't quite smell Pepto-Bismol and not think about Sunday morning because I, my mother would bring out the Pepto-Bismol and say, now, see if you can take this and then we'll go to church. And I took it, but I never, I didn't want to go. So early on, my separation from uh, any spiritual part of my life was, uh, you know, began to be missing. Um, now, all those rules that I learned were mine to follow carried me into adolescence, and I just don't have any memories whatsoever of being a rebel or doing anything at all obnoxious. I mean, my, and my mother would say that to this day, that I really was just an easy kid to raise and didn't cause her any trouble and didn't ever stay out past curfew and never took a drink. Now, at this point in time, I knew that my dad was alcoholic. I knew that. And I began to be embarrassed by him because Wednesday and Saturday had now turned into many other days of the week. And he wasn't good at all at um, holding his liquor or behaving well when he was drinking. And, you know, you couldn't go to a restaurant with him and he would not make a scene and it was awful. So I made a decision early on, boy, I'm not going to be a drinker. That's not for me. And um, I was embarrassed by him and, and and that was against the rules anyhow. So... That was all through high school. I just kind of sailed through high school, and and that was not a problem. Um, Got into college, and um, now one thing, as I think about my childhood and all of that, I do think that there were a lot of of that that separation of self from from who I really was was just continuing. And I remember always believing that other people were thinner, other people were cuter, other people were smarter, other people had this, that, and something else that I didn't have. So a lot of trying very hard to put on what, um, what was, you know, the best foot, and not always my foot, but just the, the best foot forward. Um, I went to college and hadn't had a drink yet, and so I, it's hard to believe. I know this is not your normal story, but it picks up. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, right away met my husband, and um, I was 17 and he was 24. And he was, oh, I chose perfectly. I chose perfectly. He was the son of two raging alcoholics. And he was himself not a drinker, convinced he was never going to drink. That's not going to happen for him. And so we went through college and, you know, dated that whole time. And and he was, you know, um, the one for me. And actually still is. We have 26 years of marriage next week or next month. I know. that's Now, that's a significant uh, accomplishment, especially given this life. Um at any rate, um, I'm, I do remember my very first drink. I remember it very well because my dad bought it for me, and it was on my 21st birthday in a restaurant. It was a big celebration, and we'd celebrate with my getting this first drink. I thought it was awful, and I didn't finish it. I now remember exactly what it was, and I've just forgotten it. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know. It was a whiskey sour, something I really never did grow to like very much, but um, could tolerate it uh, after a while. Um, in college, you know, in college I had I had really separated from the church scene, and, and by that time I wasn't going at all, and spirituality was something that I very much um, laughed at and, and ridiculed people for being um, hooked into their churches. Now, you remember, at this point, I had no clue that there was a difference between religion and spirituality. There was no difference in my mind. You either went to church and you were religious, or you didn't, and that was, those were the two choices. I also minored in philosophy when I was in college, and you get into all the goddess, you know, the um, arguments about whether God is, exists or doesn't exist, and I could quote those and write those papers and do all that stuff. And um, the, uh, so that was about the time that the God is dead movement was very popular, and I thought, perfect. This is just perfect for me. God's dead, and that's that. And uh, so... <laughs> 
you know, it was just a simple thing. Um, and it just, now in my, now as I look at this through my AA eyes and through my looking through the steps, it just makes so much sense that this was kind of the pattern that I was taking. The further I, the more I got into the fake who I am and further away from myself, the more I had all this justification intellectualizing and all the, the reasons that I had for that to happen. Well, at any rate, we moved, well, we married first, and then we moved to Minnesota because my husband was going to work on his Ph.D. at uh, the university here. I didn't know where Minnesota was. I had to get the map out. And I had no idea about the snow, no idea. But here we are 25 years later. Now I know what snow is. Um, but now I do remember my very first drunk. And, you know, when people talk from these podiums about remembering what you're seeking and that very first experience, I know this perfectly and you all know yours perfectly what you seek it wasn't my first drink it probably wasn't even my fifth sixth seventh drink but it was an experience that I will never forget we had uh, neighbors actually this was still in California we hadn't yet moved um, we had neighbors next door to us and they were very popular kids when we were in high school we'd all gone off to college so now we're back living next door to each other married people and they were popular, oh boy. Now, I wasn't unpopular, but I wasn't that popular. And so I valued them very much and wanted them to um, like me. So he um, was a paper salesman, and he had exchanged a bunch of paper products for a couple of cases of cold duck. And we sat in that backyard on a night when it didn't get below 95 degrees. It was the hottest night you could imagine, at least I remember it being. And we drank cold duck, drank and drank and drank it. You know, it goes down like pop. And uh, I got so comfortable. I remember this. I got, I could be funny and I could have, you know, I was thin and I was cute and I was just as happy as I could be. And it was just the night of nights. They accepted us. Well, who wouldn't? You know, we'd been through about two cases of that cold duck. Stood, stood up to walk home. Thank goodness we were walking. And, you know, you know, the whole planet just goes into a spin. And, oh, it was awful. I had to be helped home. And then my husband, who had a little more experience with drinking than I did, said, you know, just put your foot on the floor and it'll quit spinning. And, oh, oh it was just awful. It was just awful in my memory. Now it was awful. But, you know, I remember that as being magic. And I remember thinking, that's how you do this. That's it. Easy. Simple. Um, so now I put that kind of on the back burner because, um, you know, it didn't, I wasn't something that I needed all the time in those days. We were really young and active and all that stuff was happening. So it wasn't like I needed that every day, um, but I certainly remembered it. And then we did move to Minnesota. And in graduate school, as if you've done this kind of thing, you get into wine tasting parties and soirees and all that stuff you do. And all of it connected to drinking. And I found uh, very, very soon that friends of mine would say, well, if you're buying for our friends to come over, several couples, you have to know that Sharon is a heavy drinker. Now, in those days, had they known, this was not heavy, this was light, but it was heavy compared to my college-age friends. And so I remember thinking, oh, boy, if they think I'm a heavy drinker, I've got to take this underground because that can't be. Well, I can't have people thinking that. You know, that did not fit with my image. There was nothing about being a heavy drinker that fit with my image of who I was going to become and who I was. So I heard those those stories, and I, you know, laughingly, of course, um, kind of bought it, but it wasn't something that I... Um, could abide. So that there began my real intense need to take that underground. And so then, you know, time passed and, and I, I got pregnant, had Amy, and stayed home for a while when, I, when she was a baby. And that began in 1975, began daily drinking. And I don't think there was one day between 1975 and January 8th of 1992 that I didn't drink every single day. And I... Um, I just don't, I can't even tell you what caused me to cross over that line, except that there were lots of situational things that happened. My father died. I was grieving. I was separated from my mother. Um, I was home and not in the workplace, and I'd worked for seven years. And so I was missing that professionalism that I really valued and thought, you know, um, this is, here I am, you know, kind of a dowdy housewife with the baby and so I drank and um, my neighbor and I began to drink in the backyard every afternoon and she would quit and I would not um, and we have these rules she and I have these rules I've often wondered what happened to her we moved and I don't know she's probably going to show up in one of these rooms one day but 
Actually, she quit, and I she would quit, and I wouldn't. But we had these little tiny wine glasses, you know, that would just hold four ounces. And I started with those, and we had this rule that we couldn't have more than three. So that was fine. I had three of those, and I was pretty buzzed by the time uh, three of those were down, and that was, you know, all you could do. Well, um, I didn't get off of that rule of three for a long time. But I'll tell you, those glasses got bigger. <laughs> And, you know, you can buy wine glasses that <laughs> literally hold 16 ounces. And it, this, I know, this is, the, this is, the, but this is the truth. And I heard my sponsor speak from this podium. She said the same thing. I would walk in the door in the later days, walk in the door, fill that thing so that there's just, it's crowning over the top of this <laughs> glass, set it down on the counter, and then sip it from the counter so I didn't miss one single ounce of that. So I wouldn't go over those blasted three glasses of wine. <laughs> Oh, the delusional thinking, I'll tell you. Um, but, you know, simultaneously, all of this is happening now. My drinking has just escalated, and, of course, the cover-up has escalated because at this point my husband um, was drinking with me, but, you know, he would have a glass of wine, and then he'd be done, or he'd have a beer, a light beer, and then he'd be done, and that was the end of him. He'd quit, and he'd go read the paper, and I'd finish dinner and finish these other glasses of wine. And... Um, so we got involved. The, I, I work for a school district, and the school district I work for has been very um, progressive in looking at the disease of alcoholism. So way back in 73, we took the first workshop together, he and I, on alcoholism. And we decided, yes, in fact, that his parents were alcoholics, that that was the problem for them, and that we would intervene. And so in 1975, we intervened and brought them back to Minnesota, because they lived in California, brought them back to Minnesota for treatment. And we went through treatment, and I made the famous statement in treatment that time that, well, you know, this really isn't about me because this is my husband's family. <laughs> and they nod, and they say, just sit down right over there. So <laughs> you might learn a little something. So uh, if we put them in treatment, and um, that didn't work. My father-in-law left. He was furious and furious. He died furious. Um, in fact, it's too bad he couldn't tell his story because that one had stories in it. But... Um, and my mother-in-law stayed sober for a while, but it, it really didn't work. So, But we had all this education, all this information about alcoholism, and I really knew. I mean, I this is also my story is a story about it doesn't much matter how much you know. It's not about knowing because I knew. And I knew as early as 74, 75 that, you know, there's this disease and people get it and they drink too much. Um, and their lives go down the drain. I knew that. So anyway, he, they... Um, they um, didn't quite make it through treatment, and um, we continued on. Basically, life just kind of continued on. But what I know for myself is that um, I, things didn't stop for me. It went very, very fast. And I began to worry. Um, we put my mother-in-law back in treatment a second time, and I, we, they asked us not to drink during the time that they were in treatment. And I really, I, I don't, I actually, it's foggy in my mind. I don't remember if we made it or didn't make it. But I remember being, or if I made it or didn't make it, my husband made it, I know. But I remember being at the liquor cabinet when she was in treatment, hands just shaking, wondering if I was going to take that drink or not take that drink. And that particular time I didn't, but I won't ever forget that panic that I couldn't. And here's this rule. Now, remember this rule follower. They told me at the hospital, don't drink. So I had to do that. You know, that's what the rule is. And, you know, it was just hell. So this was 1976. Now, at this time when she was, no, that was 79 when she was in treatment the second time. And I thought, boy, this is really tough. Really, really tough. Um, and maybe I better take a look at myself. 79. Well, taking a look at myself was a long, long way away. Um, so anyway, I decided also along about this time that I wanted to, uh, well, in about 81, I decided I'd take a sabbatical leave and go back to school and get my master's in social work. And then I'd go back to the school district and I'd work as a social worker because I'd been a teacher. And so I went to, to a graduate school, and I remember having to be very, very careful in planning classes that I didn't have any at night. You know, you have to, because I couldn't not be drinking. So I'd have to plan all my day classes and never have a study and never have anything to do. I just had to organize my life, whether no matter the class, around whether or not I um, could be home to drink. That theme carried me way, way into um, into the 80s, where I had to arrange my entire life around that, and that was very painful. Um, I ultimately uh, decided that I would go into the field of chemical dependency in school. So 
<laughs> you know, this, my higher power has really led me on a very interesting path. And um, what I what what I did was I took a pharmacology class. I panicked the whole time I sat there, just panicked because they tell you that women have cirrhosis more commonly than men do. They tell you that uh, you know breast cancer is more common for red wine drinkers. And I mean, I would just break into these sweats in this class, this pharmacology class, while I was learning this stuff. And uh, but of course, did I stop drinking? No, I couldn't get home fast enough to get that big glass of wine poured. But uh, anyway, so I, I applied for the job and became the chemical awareness specialist. <laughs> they were right about that. And <laughs> at my high school. And so now, you know, if you think about the width of space between who am I presenting to the world now, this person with a master's degree and chemical awareness specialist and all of that stuff I'm doing up here on the on the outside and what's happening on the inside to this poor lonely woman who goes home every night and drinks. Um, it, and, you know, the hard part for me was that was so incongruous with the concept in my head that I'm the happy one. You know, what's wrong with this happy one who goes home and drinks every night? I really, I really did not get it, did not get what was the matter. What was the missing piece for me? Um, so as the disease progressed, now here I'm doing all this speaking in the community and telling people about how awful it is that these kids are using all this pot and, and drinking all this alcohol and, um, you know, and my disease is just progressing like crazy. I would have gray outs at night. I probably had blackouts too, but I was most conscious of the gray outs where I'd get on the telephone and it was foggy. You know, what did I say? What did I agree to? So I took to writing everything down. <laughs> Don't think about quitting drinking. Just start figuring out a way. So I'd write, you know, the phone would ring. I'd grab the pencil on the paper and write it all down so I could reconstruct it. And the following morning, um, oh, how many years I did this. I, I can't even imagine how come I did this for so many years. But I would get wake up in the morning, you know, in that fog you're in in the morning, and try and reconstruct the night before. And I'll tell you, that got harder and harder and harder. And I fortunately had some notes. But... Uh, <laughs> But it was, you know, and I would think, now, did who called and, you know, did I have sex and what did, uh, how was it and what's going on here? And, you know, uh, and, you know, and not to embarrass my daughter because what's worse than your mother talking about her sex life from the podium, but, but I will tell you that it is way better when you remember it now. <laughs> so anyway, I... <laughs> But that's what happened. It just got to be a daily, nightly obsession about this drinking. And I would, I had 10 liquor stores, and I would go to 10 different liquor stores so people wouldn't know. They wouldn't, you know, I didn't want them to know that I was having that much, drinking that much, so I had to, um, to cover that up. And I had to, but I would wake up in the morning and instantly have an inventory. What's in the cupboard? What do I have to buy? Where did I go last? And when will I buy it? And when will I get the next drink? And so, and of course, wake up in the morning after the night sweats and the, you know, the, I didn't know what that was about. I went to the doctor and said, you know, I'm not getting to sleep through the night and I'm waking up in a cold sweat. Oh, he said, you're in your middle 40s. That's what that is. You know, that's, that's, that's nothing. That's just to be expected. And when you think you're ready, we'll put you on hormones. And so, <laughs> Never once, never once asked me, uh, you know, are, how much do you drink? Do you drink? None of that. Um, so it was the obsession. It was, um, you know, forgetting what I was doing. It was um, people would go to bed in our family, and then I would drink into the night, and or I'd go to bed, and then I'd get up and drink into the night, and just obsessed. It was just that craziness we get into. Meanwhile, my day job is talking two people, kids, parents, and adults about how awful this chemical dependency stuff is. I couldn't have taken more of a path away from who I was if I had tried. However, when I did my fourth step then, ultimately I did my fourth step and then did my fifth step, and of course the shame involved in presenting one thing to the public and being another thing at home, the shame was so massive that I, you know, presented this to the minister who listened, and he said, I said, you know, I, it was just deception. I was just, uh, you know, I lied at every turn. And he said, oh, no. He said, I want you to think differently about that job. He said, I want you to think about that job as your readiness, that you learned all of that, you got all of that, and that was your readiness. And, you know, so I've been able a little bit to kind of, in fact, more than a little bit, uh, I've been able significantly to be able to put that to rest. 
at any rate, I, uh, you know, it was it was gruesome. It was awful. And by this time, we had two kids, and the marriage was reasonable. But you know, we just kept saying, well, we got kids, and we're busy, and so this is what happens in middle aged marriage. It's just not all that great. Well, of course it wasn't. He didn't know who I was. And I would never let him in on anything. And and, and um, so it wasn't good. It was bleak. And so what happened? I think what's interesting for me is what happened was that I really got so tired of not being who I thought I was. I really could not abide it one more minute. I couldn't live that lie. And uh, I was driving home one afternoon, and Neil Diamond was singing. I mean, this all things. Neil Diamond was singing on the radio, and he said, he sings a song, There Was a Time. And there's a line in it that says, I dreamed a dream that life would be different from this hell I'm living. And that was, I mean, I hate to tell you, I think that was my moment of clarity. That this, <laughs> Neil Diamond, I should write him a letter. And uh, <laughs> because I thought at that moment, I can't go on with this. This is insanity. This is daily daily insanity and so I began to think well actually I'd been thinking for several years how am I going to do this uh, you know and I thought about changing um, medical plans and I thought about you know seeing a friend and I thought about all kinds of things but uh, decided that I would actually maybe really seriously begin to think about this and I knew I was going to recover you know one thing about my job is that I knew about you folks and I knew about AA, I knew about a recovery, and I kept thinking, when I'm retired, I'll be recovering. Or when I'm 50, I'll be recovering. Now, that's going to be true, I hope. But, uh, you know, I kept putting it off into some future time slot where I could do that. And um, so, um, finally, I, I ended up, of all things, with this horrible cold. This is horrible cold. I had to stay home from work. I never stay home. I have 156 days. So I never stay home, but I had to stay home. I set the timer. I set the timer for 2 p.m. because my son was coming home at 2.30 and said, okay, I'm going to call the therapist by 2 o'clock. And when I was in graduate school, I had done therapy. My my therapy, my um, supervisor, of course, was in charge of the chemical dependency unit. Wouldn't that just be? And uh, so I called him, or I called his secretary, and by 2 o'clock, the buzzer went off, and I made the phone call and said, you know, I really need to take a look at this disease. And they said, this was January 7th, and they said, um, February 26th, you can have an appointment. I said, perfect. That'll be great. <laughs> so, but then they called me back. Uh, he called me back and said, tomorrow. <laughs> so, at any rate, there we go. So, uh, you know, I went in and at the moment, I remember dressing that morning, that morning of January 8th. And I had to, it was January 8th, it was January, you know how it is here. And I opened the windows because the sweat was just pouring off me. I couldn't get any makeup on it, but I had to look good, you know, to go in and see this guy. <laughs> So I went in, I mean, oh, it was awful. It was just awful. But it was, you know, at that moment, it was the beginning of the surrender for me. I was so ready. I actually probably had been ready for years. But, uh, you know, I, it was like my feet were stuck in concrete. My mind was ahead. I was ready to be recovering. My feet were stuck. I couldn't imagine how you make that step. I would drive by the Glen Lake Alano, which is near my house, and think, who are those people? And do I know any of them? I probably can't go in there because I know them. And, uh, you know, and so all of these reasons that I couldn't do, I couldn't make myself take that step. I was so depressed about life being the hell that it was. You know, that if I listened to country music and I had heard Born to Lose instead of There Was a Time, I might have killed myself, you know, <laughs> because I was just that far down. I was really, at that point, bleak. Um, but at any rate, he put me in treatment, and I heard it, I heard something at a meeting. Uh, in fact, Kimberly said it, and I've just cherished it, Kimberly, because she said the best thing treatment can do is produce a good AA member or a regular AA member, and I think that is just exactly what happened for me. It was exactly what I needed to have happen. I got the exact right people. It was the exact right time. The family was in exactly the right spot, and we were able to um, to do this thing called recovery. Um, I know that I wasn't done with the facade because when I got to the hospital the very first night in detox, I shared a room in detox with a woman friend, now a dear woman friend, and she said, she came in and introduced herself, and I'm so-and-so, and I'm a nurse, she said. And I said, and I'm Sharon, and I'm a social worker. And then she said, and we should know better. <laughs> and we should have known better. We did know better. We just were stuck. So, um, you know, the problem for me is that I was really stuck with this God business. I was really stuck with this whole spirituality. I read these steps. I thought, oh, this is not for me. In fact, in the car on the way to the hospital that night, I said to my husband, I am going to have trouble with this God stuff. And, uh, and I did have trouble with it. But I'll tell you, 
Um, I had an outstanding therapist who was very good about relating what the big book talks about. When um, Bill is, if you remember, I know, I know you're doing Bill's story when he talks about um, looking at his friend who has a glow about him, and he says, I got religion. And then Bill says, well, I can't buy that. That's just not for me. I can't buy that stuff. And he gets this, you know, idea that he can make one, make a, a God up for himself. And my therapist was very good about helping me do that so that I could recreate and start from absolute scratch because that's where I was. I was absolutely depleted spiritually, depleted. There was nothing, bankrupt. And um, so I really had to start from scratch. There was no way to rebuild what was what was missing. Um, church was not something that I was um, hooked to, and, and I just really had to start from scratch. Um, but I did, and um, I think about, when I think about treatment, and it goes on forever, you know, it goes on for months, and when I think about that, I think um, about it being AA um, support, because I immediately, when we were in the hospital, the Wooddale group people came to the hospital, and I thought, you people are just like me, you know, you look like me, you sound like me, you act like me, you are me. Uh, the only thing I thought is that they didn't truly understand the nature of my disease because one woman said, I'll never forget it, she says, you know, I haven't even thought about having a drink for years. And I thought, well, you don't know what I feel like. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was terminally unique that there was something unique about me that I was not going to be able to ever, ever, ever get that kind of feeling. Um, in fact, you know, I don't think about it. It does happen. It is a miracle. It is an absolute miracle. It's a gift to me. Um, I, so I went to the, my very first AA meeting at Wooddale Colonial, and I will never forget how wonderful those people were. The looks on their faces, the uh, acceptance in their hearts, and then they had this magic thing for me. They had this first step group just for me. <laughs> and, you know, now since that time I've learned they do that for every newcomer, but uh, <laughs> that night, I mean, that was mine. <laughs> and and I, I went back thinking those people are so incredible that they would do that just just for me. So I had a, a really good beginning in the very first place. Um, what I had to do, though, was really, I really had to struggle with the meditation, with getting um, rid of the resentments and the backlog of, of ill will that I felt toward, toward God, basically, and, try, and, and trying to reconstruct what was, um, you know, a huge, huge missing piece for me. And it took months, and, I, and I'd like to say that once I started recovering, life just got to be a piece of cake, but in fact, it didn't. And, uh, it, and I, I said to the therapist, my friend, the therapist, on the day that I saw him on that January 8th, I said, you know, I get the physical dependency. I get that. I understand that. That part's clear to me. What I don't get is what else is wrong with my life? <laughs> Well, he said, I, he didn't laugh, bless his heart. He just looked at me and said, well, if anything comes up, you know, I'm sure you can get some therapy around it, and I'd be happy to help. Well, what did come up was that I'm not the only alcoholic in our family. Um, my daughter is alcoholic, and her depression and her alcoholism came up in about my fifth month of recovery. And um, that's probably even more painful for me than my own recovery because as a mother, you expect to be able to give and to do and to provide and to, you know, and to keep your life painless and it isn't doable. I also know that the that the genetic link through me, the genetic link through her dad, the genetic link from grandparents is just overwhelming. So uh, we left one treatment and went wham, slam right into the next one. And I think in a way it was my higher power saying, you're not quite getting this yet, so you get one more chance. <laughs> I also think, though, if I look at the big picture and I think about timing, how miraculous for our family that I was in recovery so I could parent her in that time when she needed a parent probably more than ever before. Um, so so it didn't just turn out to be, a, a you know, this perfect life and everything was wonderful. Um, there were some spectacularly wonderful parts. And what began to happen for me at about six months of sobriety is that I began to get little tiny minutes, not even minutes, seconds of serenity, of peace. And I think, you know, I, I can remember the feeling thinking, what is this? I don't know this feeling. I haven't had this feeling since I was about nine years old, laying there on the ground in California, thinking I was, had this perfect family. And, and they were just little seconds of, of serenity. And so I thought, you know, this is maybe a little spooky. This is kind of spiritual in nature. And, um, but, you know, you just kind of go in it, and it grows. And so I had an experience up at um, Lutzen. I was doing some, with a professional group, I was doing some uh, rock climbing. And I'm not a rock climber by nature. And they suggested <laughs> that the point of this 
professional growth group was that we would learn to do this risk-taking thing, and then we would, you know, be able to take risks in our workplace. And I'm thinking to myself, I have quit drinking. There is no risk I can't take now. You know, the worst, I have done the worst possible thing you could ever imagine doing, so this won't be so hard. And going up was not so hard. But, you know, when you have to repel off of this cliff, this is an unnatural act. <laughs> This this takes a little work. So, so you know, you're belayed with this guy in front of you, and you're belayed with this guy down there, and there's no way you can die, although your mind doesn't know that. So, so I, uh, but I remember feeling I now have access to this higher power who I had created, this image that I had created. So I have access to this higher power, and I can use it. And so I kind of did this in comes the spirit, out goes the fear, sort of breathing, deep breathing, and I repelled right off of that mountain. And it was just a spectacular experience. And what the man who was belaying me in front of me said as we sat around that night, he said, I don't know what happened to you. I don't know what happened to you. But you had this paralyzed fear on your face. And then all of a sudden it was gone. He said it was magic. And I thought, well, it's not really magic. It's spiritual. That may be magic. You define it however you like. But what I knew at that moment, and it was like that was another moment of clarity that I have gone back to and hung on to and clutched as my my real understanding, is that I can do that anytime I need it. That's available to me. And whether it's backing off a mountain or talking to someone or, you know, resisting an urge to get into a slippery situation or whatever it is I need, I have that power. That's available to me. That's mine. And I wouldn't know that if it weren't for these steps and if it weren't for you people and if it weren't that I have been reborn. This is absolutely to me. I can't even put enough superlatives with this to tell you what a miraculous 180 this is for me as I think about it my mother is 83 and she doesn't quite get much of this but she's in a nursing home but she reads the Al-Anon stuff although she calls it Alicon so <laughs> I think it's perfect and so tonight tonight she said she said well honey you know I'll be thinking of you and I read Alicon today and it said something about peace and so she said I read that and I'll be thinking of you and she said and you know what you just stand up there and you tell them that you are so happy now and, <laughs> and you know and I thought and so I said to her well do you see a difference oh she said I see a difference so you know I'm thinking <laughs> From the, you know, from the mouth of the babes, sort of, the elderly babes, um, that was, <laughs> that, that really is what's happened to me. I, I try in my own living now to work a really powerful, strong, um, meditation, a reading program. I really try very hard to stay in absolute, not only daily, but two, three times a day contact with my higher power. It's a real significant piece of support for me. And, and I owe that to AA. I owe every bit of this to AA. There isn't one part of who I am today that I don't owe to the fellowship of AA. Um, you know, I resisted a bit in um, the whole concept of sponsorship because I'm supposed to be the one to tell people, you know, I'm supposed to be the advice giver. I'm the one that's supposed to do this. But ultimately, I decided I needed a sponsor. And so I approached Pat, and she has been my sponsor. And what I can say about that piece of AA is that not only is Pat a gift to me and all of what she says and all of what she provides, but all of the people that surround her that now are my people. And, you know, we have this wonderful sort of, uh, as we do in AA, have this wonderful sort of uh, camaraderie and um, sense of togetherness that is just unduplicatable. So what I'd like to do is just say as I close um, that... I want to read from the big book because it is exactly what I do or what I try and do. And this is from one of the chapters, and it's called Fear of Fear. And, you know, I was possessed by it. We all are. And it says, I try to live our program as it has been outlined to me one day at a time. I try to live today so that tomorrow I won't be ashamed when I wake up in the morning. Oh, such a gift not to be ashamed in the morning. In the old days, I hated to wake up and look back at what last night was like. I never could face it the next morning. And unless I had some rosy picture of what was going to happen that day, I wouldn't even feel like getting up in the morning at all. It really wasn't living. Now I feel so very grateful, not only for my sobriety, which I try to maintain day by day, but I'm grateful also for the ability to help other people. And I guess what I believe is that, you know, for me what works is, a step meeting, a big book meeting, a speaker meeting, call my sponsor, talk to my friends, and...
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 